This is one of the many patients who go into the operating theatre every day. From the moment that he is taken into the anaesthetic room until he wakes in the ward, it's up to all those who come into contact with him to take charge of his well-being. The patient is frequently upset by neglect of small details of procedure which are less noticeable than the grosser defects of anaesthetic technique. Here, collected together, are many such errors. Fear has an important effect on the course of anaesthesia. Many patients are nervous in spite of preoperative medication. They should never be left alone. Without the reassuring presence of a nurse, the unfamiliar apparatus in the anaesthetic room is very likely to increase their fears. Quiet is an important factor. Any disturbance places an additional strain on the patient. This anaesthetic room is being used as a corridor and also as a storeroom for instruments needed elsewhere. On her return, the nurse appears to have not the slightest interest in the case. The anaesthetist also has no time for even a few words with the patient. These would have done much to reassure her. The anaesthetist begins now to check over his machine. This should have been done before. Time is wasted changing cylinders and fetching instruments. To the patient, highly sensitive to noise and unable to see all that's going on, these sounds are very alarming. The doors of the anaesthetic room have been left open and her growing fears are not relieved by the sight of a surgeon instructing his students in the finer points of his last operation. Again, the anaesthetic room appears to provide a convenient corridor. But the anaesthetist is too busy filling his ether jar to pay any attention to such details. A strong smell of spilt ether has now added to the patient's discomfort. Without washing his hands or glancing at the patient's chart, the anaesthetist begins induction. The mask is put onto the patient's face with no warning. Almost immediately, the nurse removes the blankets in order to cut the bandages. To the semi-conscious patient, it appears that the operation is about to begin and she struggles violently. At the first sign of movement, the porter has rushed in. He and the nurse fling themselves on the wretched patient. The anaesthetist, meanwhile, loses control of the mask. At last she is quiet, but by this time everyone, including the patient, is warm and sweating. While induction proceeds to the satisfaction of the anaesthetist, the patient is left with her knees drawn up. As anaesthesia deepens, her limbs relax, her knees fall over sideways, almost dragging her from the trolley to the ground. In putting her back, no one notices her arm slip out of the coverings and hang down over the edge of the trolley. Despite all these mishaps, the anaesthetist makes no attempt to check the position of the patient on the trolley before going into the theatre. During the previous struggle, her elbow was left sticking out over the side. This catches against the door as they pass. When the patient is in the theatre, 
her head falls back as she is lifted because the canvas of the stretcher doesn't come far enough up to support it. Fortunately, the nurse notices the patient's arm in time to save it from being crushed against the edge of the table. All this delay and the fact that the anaesthetist has needlessly removed the mask means that the patient will now have reached very light anaesthesia. As you would have realized, all the mistakes shown here were very simple and could have been avoided. This is how it should have been done. The patient is brought into the anaesthetic room by a porter and a nurse from the ward. The nurse goes off to put on her gown and mask, leaving the patient in the care of the anaesthetic room nurse. In hospitals where such staff is not available, the porter must remain, as on no account should the patient be left alone. When the ward nurse returns, she removes the patient's head shawl and loosens the clothing round his throat. If necessary, she also cuts any bandages round the neck. Everything is now ready for the anaesthetist. On entering, he closes the doors carefully behind him and says a few words to the patient. A reassuring explanation of what is about to take place will gain his confidence and ensure his cooperation. The anaesthetist should make it a part of his routine to look at the chart and check the details of the patient's condition and of the premedication. Before beginning the induction, he sniffs the mask to make sure that the right anaesthetic vapour is coming through and inspects the mouth for false or loose teeth. At the same time, the nurse can reassure the patient by holding his hand. She keeps up a slight movement of her thumb. If the hand is held motionless, the sensation becomes blunted and the feeling of reassurance is lost. In the event of struggling, the anaesthetist never loses control of the mask. If restraint has to be applied, it should be just enough to prevent damage to the patient and to those around him, and no more. Ideally, two attendants should be present, but when only one is available, violent struggling should be restrained by catching the wrists, holding the arms to the side, and leaning across the trolley at the level of the patient's thighs. Drumming of the heels on the trolley may cause severe bruising unless it's quickly checked. When induction has reached the stage of true surgical anesthesia, the nurse may cut the bandages, leaving the sterile dressing in place. The coverings are then put back. The patient is now ready. The anaesthetist looks on either side to make sure that the patient is properly placed on the trolley and then gives the word to go into the theatre. On arrival at the side of the table, the anaesthetist assures himself that the canvas comes up well under the patient's head. He is then gently lifted onto the table. The common position of the patient on the operating table is lying on the back with the arms placed along the sides and the head slightly raised on a flat pillow and turned a little to one side. Clenched hands may result in gangrene so the fingers must be straightened and any ring should already have been removed before the hands are placed under the buttocks. This is enough to keep the arms in position with the elbows close to the sides throughout the operation. Some anaesthetists prefer to use cuffs fastened to the side of the table. 
If the cuffs are slack, however, the elbows may slip over the edge. Another method is to use a towel laid across the table under the patient. The ends are brought round the forearms and hands and tucked in. No matter what method is used to keep the patient's arms to his sides, it is essential to see that they are secure. If an arm should slip out during the course of the operation, the musculospiral nerve might be compressed between the humerus and the edge of the table and lead to paralysis. Alternatively, the arms may be placed on the patient's chest, either crossing them over or placing the hands one on top of the other. The theatre gown is then turned back to enclose the arms and the ends are tucked under. During anaesthesia, the normal heat regulating mechanisms are affected and warmth is essential in the care of the patient. Spare blankets should be placed on the warm pipes of the radiator, ready for the return to the ward. Some hospitals are fitted with heated cupboards for this purpose. The theatre temperature should be at about 75 degrees Fahrenheit in abdominal operations or where there is a large area of body exposed. The patient's coverings also are important. Small rubber sheets should be used as large ones encourage fluid loss by sweating. During the operation, as much of the patient's body and limbs must be kept covered with light blankets or towels as is possible without impeding the surgeon. A bald man can lose a lot of heat from his head alone and a shawl will do much to prevent this. In most cases, the patient's eyes close automatically during anesthesia. If the eyes remain open, the lids should be closed every few minutes to moisten the cornea. Great care must be taken to make certain that the eyes are shut every time the mask is removed or replaced. Rubbing the exposed eye with ether-soaked gauze gives rise to that painful condition known as anaesthetic eye. In the same way, make sure that the eyes are shut before putting on towels. In deep anaesthesia, when tear formation is reduced, a drop of liquid paraffin may be instilled into the eyes to prevent dryness. Some anaesthetists use this or a thick layer of sterile Vaseline in all cases. The maintenance of a free airway is an essential of anaesthesia. Don't forget that apart from gross respiratory obstruction, there may be minor hindrances to the breathing that can pass unnoticed until serious complications have set in. Here, for example, the anaesthetist has realized that the breathing is unsatisfactory, as shown by diminished movement of the rebreathing bag. It may be due to a tired or a too eager assistant leaning on the patient's chest. The use of a retractor under the liver or diaphragm may embarrass the breathing. Trauma in the region of the diaphragm is a contributory factor to the development of post-operative collapse of the lung. The good assistant will not continue to exert pressure unless it's really helping in the performance of the operation. The gradual accumulation of unwanted instruments on the patient's chest is an added burden. The anaesthetist should call attention to these and ask for them to be removed. Under anaesthesia, the vasomotor system cannot compensate for sudden change of posture. Any alteration of position must be done gently and smoothly and should be supervised by the anaesthetist. Rough handling while putting on an abdominal binder may result in a serious fall in blood pressure.
This is particularly true at the end of a long operation.